It really has. Um, singing that song, it really got me emotional um, while we were singing, you know, God, your goodness. It's just all my life you've been faithful. Um, and in this church's life is a testimony of God's faithfulness, without a doubt. He's been faithful in every area. Um, as a body, we've never lacked in any area. And we're looking forward to what he's going to do in the future. Um, I prepared a message which I think is very relevant for us as a body because I also asked God, where are we going as a body? And what is his next step and his next phase that he has for us? Um, what is next? God, we've, we've gone through 10 years now um, and uh, you've been doing, he's been doing amazing work, but I know he's called us for more than what we've seen right now. Um, we haven't seen the plans that he has and we haven't seen or, and I, and I don't think we understand the impact that our lives have already had on people, not only in our communities, but in our families. And I just know this is the beginning uh, of, of more than what God has got planned for us. Uh, ten years is, um, I loved what Pastor John Byrne said this morning. He said, you know, you really know that as a church you are established when grandchildren become the testimony of what the church is doing. Not just... 10 years, 10 years is great, but when the grandchildren become the voice, like honoring Ray and Marie. I don't know what to say. The lives that you have influenced and the children's children that are Christians because of your ministry, that's a legacy. That's the legacy that we're going for as a church. Not just 10. We want to see our children's children preach the gospel. We want to see our children's children influence the world and stand strong in the principles of God. So I'm really going to try to stop crying now. I'm going to read a scripture, fantastic scripture in the Bible. It's in Mark 5. Um, it says, Jesus raises a dead girl and heals a sick woman. When Jesus had a, again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, this is 10 years later, give me a moment. Okay. Now I have to get used to this because now it's fogging up on this thing. What's going on? <laughs> okay. Um, he crossed to the other side of the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. He said, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes... I will be healed. Immediately a bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from a suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, you see people crowding against you. His disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at the feet of Jesus, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? 
Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him after Jesus turns gangster. Uh, that wasn't in the script. I'm just saying this is what happened. After he put them all out. He didn't knock them out. He just put them out. Put them outside. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him <clears throat> and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Teleakum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And that really worked out well. <laughs> and then he told them, get her a happy meal because she is hungry. She needs to eat. Amazing scripture. Amazing passage. Just that story in itself is a powerful story. When I read this story of a few weeks ago now already, knowing that we, we're preparing for our 10-year anniversary and asking God, what is the message that, it, that He has for us as a body about where He wants us to go? This was the scripture that, I, that He took me to. And while I was reading it, I got a little bit nostalgic. Um, because this story is like this divine intersection this collision of characters in one story. This, this unplanned collision of characters that has this amazing outcome. And it made me nostalgic because I, I knew that Neville was coming to visit us here in Canada to, to be our guest um, for this morning, which he, he was late. He hasn't shown up yet, um, but he's going to be here tomorrow morning and he's going to be here tomorrow evening. So he got his visa, very happy about that. But it made me nostalgic because I started thinking about Neville and our lives in South Africa and, and how, um, how we got here. Because when you think of 10 years, you almost think of, you know, how did things fall in line and how we got here. And it made me think of my life would not have been the same if I didn't meet Neville Norton. In 1994, I went to an English-speaking church for the first time in my life. I was 19 years old turning 20. And you're asking why is it relevant to say it was an English-speaking church? It's relevant because I've never been in one there was an English-speaking church before that. And an English-speaking church that I went to was way different and weird compared to Afrikaans-speaking churches. This English-speaking church had people raising their hands, singing out loud, laughing, happy to be in church, which was totally weird and different than what I was used to. In Afrikaans churches, you were told to be quiet, don't say a word. We even have street signs up around the church that says, quiet, church. Because church was something where you want, where when I grew up, I wasn't allowed to speak in church. You couldn't say a word. It was dead. It was quiet. Nobody wanted to be there, but they had to go because they were born in South Africa. So you're a Christian and you're Afrikaans, so you have to go to church. So I went to this English-speaking church for the first time. And the reason I went there was because there was a girl that I really liked. And she was going there. And the only place where I could see her was in church. So God got me. Yeah, he used the girl. And I know he got some of you the same way, Eddie. I, sorry, did I say the name? I'm sorry, that just popped out. And, and Bob and uh, uh, Karen and Tom. And there's, God has used, he uses many different ways for us to get into church. He got me because I went to meet a girl and then I met him and it changed my life radically. I wanted to go back to that church and I went back the next week and I couldn't understand a word they were saying. Not because I didn't understand English, it was my second language, but the terminology was just so different. 
I didn't understand like some of the words. It was when I went back to South Africa now recently, and I had, to, I had to go preach in Afrikaans. I struggled because I couldn't remember what the terminologies we use in English are in Afrikaans again because it, it doesn't sound the same. So I was listening to this guy speaking, and I remember saying to one of my friends that was sitting next to me, I said, "Man, I wish there was an Afrikaans church that was like this church." And he said, "There is one." I said, "Really? Where is it?" He said, "Well, you have to travel over seven continents." cross the Jordan River. No, he didn't say that. He says, just down the street from your house. It's really close. It's just down the street. You'll see it. It looks like a circus tent. It was a circus tent because that's what they started to meet in when they started the church was this massive tent. So I started going to this church and I'll never forget. Um, I, I can only go in the evenings because in the morning services, I still had to go with my parents to the, the other church. Um, because that's what we had to do. So in the evenings, I was free to go wherever I wanted to go. So I went in the evenings, 19 years old, I started going to this church called Leven de Voort, Living Word in South Africa. Now, being at this church, we were standing around as a bunch of young guys, and, and just after the service talking, and, and just, you know, doing what young people, talking about nonsense. And the next moment, this big dude um, that was just preaching, who I haven't met yet, he was a bodybuilder, he beat Arnold Schwarzer Cookie in bodybuilding in Mr. Universe. Big guy comes up, and he puts his arm around me, and it's heavy. Uh, because it's big. And he said to us, hey, you guys want to come over to my place for pizza? And I'm like, like all of us? He said, yeah, I'm buying. All of you want to come over to my place for pizza? Like, yeah, I love, like, I love pizza. All young people love pizza. So, yeah, got in our cars. Everybody follow, followed him to his house. And standing around his kitchen counter, he brought pizzas out, and we were all just eating. And that became a, a, a tradition for us. Sunday nights, we go to Neville's home, and we go eat pizza, which was awesome. And we were standing around eating pizza. And what happened is he started sharing about the gifts that God has placed in our lives, but not in a weird way, just in such a real and authentic way that God wants to use us to influence other people. It changed my life so radically that I, I couldn't read regular books at university anymore. At that point, I was st studying um, sports, um, business and sports, and I, all I could read, I wanted to read, was the Bible. And so I decided I had to change, and I switched over and started studying theology. Neville gave me a part-time job to study. While I was studying, I was working at Living Word, and I became the youth pastor. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch in South Africa, there was another family, and there were three kids in this family, two boys and one girl, and the girl was a rebel. She also went to the same kind of Dutch Reformed church that I went to in South Africa, and she went through the process of where she started reading things in the Bible and seeing that the Bible says that believe in God and be baptized, and she went to the reverend in the in the church, and he said to him, I'm trying to figure this out. It says, believe in God and be baptized. Yet, all we do is we don't baptize anybody but babies. We only sprinkle babies. I don't understand this. How can this be right when the Bible says we're supposed to believe in God and then be baptized, make that decision? And the reverend said to us, stop asking questions. <laughs> Which, if you know her, you don't say stop asking questions because then she wants to understand it even more. So which caused the church to kick her whole family out of the church. Yeah, church kicked people out of the church, which in itself is a little weird. So what was fantastic was even though they got kicked out of that church, this family now had to start attending a different church. And they found out about a church called Leven de Voort. And they started attending Leven de Voort. Now, Neville is so connected with my life. Neville is such a connected with, connection with my life. Neville caused me to have three kids. <laughs> That's how connected we are. Neville is the reason why I have Lene and Anjo and Kaylee. Because what happened was, at the same church where I was now the youth pastor, this new family started attending, and we had youth services on Friday nights, and on Sunday, um, Sunday mornings, we had a youth church where, where we had to have our own praise and worship bands, and lo and behold, we had to have auditions for new people to join the band, and this girl that was the rebel wanted to join the worship band. 
And I remember having the auditions in this tent, and they had to come in one by one, and, they, and then they have to sing, and then they have to leave, and then I go speak with the parents afterwards if they made it or they didn't make it. In those days, not everybody got a ribbon. Um, it was a little bit different. Um, and, and what happened was she came in, and I remember, I can remember the first time I saw her walking into the church. Her hair was long. She looked like a hippie, big heels on, but she started singing, and she sang Shout to the Lord, and Darlene Check dropped the mic. And I remember walking out, after, which means it was really good. And I remember walking out afterwards and going to her parents and saying to her parents, you know what? She's amazing. She, she did really good. Um, she's in the worship team. This was on a Tuesday night. We rehearsed on Thursday evening. And can I marry her when she turns 21? Her dad looked at me funny and her mom said, please. <laughs> I was 20 years old at that time. She was 14. It was illegal to date, as you could understand. We never dated until she turned 19 years old. We got engaged when she was 20. And when, we, when she turned 21, we got married. Neville is the reason I have three kids. We do not understand how the connections in our lives influence where we are going. You don't understand how the people that you are connected with are being influenced by the things that you are doing and saying. Neville is the reason why Bish is here. He's not his dad, but <laughs> he's the reason. So two years after we were in Canada, we started, we planted Numa Church. Two years after we planted the church, I went back to South Africa to go and minister. Um, and Neville asked me to come preach in Levin of Worth in the evening service. I also led praise and worship that night. Levin of Worth su supplied the band for me. I didn't know any of the band members. I just showed up, led praise and worship. And behind me was a skinny young man with long hair, cleanly shaved, um, in, in jeans, um, and, and he looked a little geeky, um, but he played guitar really well. He was a really good guitar player. Never spoke a word to him. Leading praise and worship, preaching the message. After the message, I prayed for people at the front, and while I was busy praying for somebody at the front, I saw him standing in an aisle. If this is the church, I can exactly know where he was. I can still see it. He was standing in the aisle right there, um, and I said to the person in front, sorry, just give me a moment. I just have to go do something quickly. I stepped out of it. I walked up to him. I said to him, I don't know how. I don't know where. I don't know when. But I know we are going to be in ministry together. Uh, and he said, okay. <laughs> no, actually, actually, he had a thing where he goes, cool, 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 cool. He said that. Two years later, we are in Numa Church, and our church is at a place where we need an associate pastor as a full-time staff member. And I say to our leadership team, Yvonne and David, and them were still there, and I, and I said to them, I know exactly who we have to get. I don't know what his name is. <laughs> because I never met him. I just know who he is. So now I have to contact Liev and Wurt um, and say to them, two years ago, I was... I was um, leading praise and worship in your church, and there was a guitar player. He had long hair. He was cleanly shaved, tall, skinny guy, kind of geeky. Um, do you know what his name is? And they go through the names, and they're like trying to figure out, long hair, skinny, square, no, no, no. And, and eventually somebody, Marinus, one of the guys, said, oh, I think it was Bish. So they showed me a picture of Bish. He looked like that, but with a beard that comes to his navel. I'm like, that's not the guy. <laughs> they say, no, that's him. So I got in contact with Bish on Skype. We had one Skype phone call. I said, remember I said to you two years ago, there's going to be a time when we're going to be in ministry together. The time is now. Will you come to Canada? He said, yes, please. Got on a plane and arrived. It is because of the connection with Neville that a man left a country to come and minister to people in a different country. We are all connected. It's a divine connection, and I don't think we understand how important these connections are. New Church, I really believe for us to, to make an impact, and, and not just an impact, something that is, that is over time, generational, we have to understand that every single connection that we are making with people has the possibility to change their lives for the better. 
There is a mandate placed on us to change communities, but we have to understand that every person that we speak to, every opportunity we have to love people is an opportunity that God has given us to form a connection with somebody that needs to connect with Him, and He wants to use us to do it. So once again, um, when we start peeling back the layers um, of, of this story, we see that these two people are connected. And I want you to know it is important for you to be connected. If you are not connected in a church, get connected. And I know in some of your minds you're going, you know what, you do you, I do me. Yeah, have you heard that before? You do you, I do me. You do you, I do me. The problem is you doing you, it's influencing me. Because every single one of us are supposed to be connected. You just coming to church on your own and thinking it's just you doing you, you are having an impact on other people that's supposed to be influenced. We are supposed to work together to bring people to God's kingdom. We're all deeply connected. Now Mark 5 begins by, by talking about a synagogue leader by the name of J Jairus. And in this story about Jairus, there's like this major interruption. Remember the story starts off with there was this synagogue leader, Jairus, and he went to Jesus because his daughter was really sick. And then suddenly, there's a woman with an issue of blood, and Jairus is kind of forgotten. But the story of Jairus was very serious. And the reason why Mark like sandwiched these two stories together is because he's telling to try, trying to tell us that the connection in people's lives are significant. And these two, on the surface, when you look at them, they are not connected. But when you peel back that onion, you see that they are very connected. Because on the surface, they are almost opposite. Jairus is a church leader, synagogue leader. He, he's, he is esteemed. He is honored. He is wealthy. He is somebody that people respect looked up to, they like, he's like a pastor, um, like pastor, he's way up there, people know who he is, and she, she can't even go to the synagogue, because she is unclean, she's not allowed to touch people, she's not allowed to be around people that have sacrificially cleaned themselves, because it makes them dirty, and then they have to go clean themselves again, so people despise her, the last thing she is, is on it, uh, in modern day terms to understand is, he drives a Tesla, she can't afford an Uber. She is so poor because she spent all her money on doctors. She's got nothing, and he's got everything. So on the surface, it looks like they're not, not at all the same. But, but we know that deep down, they have a lot in common. Because life, life will bring, doesn't matter who you are. Life will bring things on your path that levels the playing field. Doesn't matter how much money you've got, it won't fix it. Doesn't matter what degrees you have, it won't fix it. Doesn't matter who your dad is on earth, he can't fix it. Life will bring things into your life that levels the playing field no matter how much influence or wealth you have. And this is what happened in this story. Life doesn't care where you come from because life will bring stuff, but What's awesome about this story is both of these people brought their stuff to Jesus. And that is their connection. They have nothing in common on the surface. But both of them end up at the feet of Jesus. At the same place, having to push people out of the way to get an appointment with him. They both had to physically push people out of the way. Jairus is a pastor. I can see him walking in the crowd and people going to, hey, Jairus, awesome message on Sunday. Thank you. Move. I have to get to Jesus. She's pushing people out of the way. She's not even allowed to touch them. I have to get to Jesus. I have to get to his feet. And what, what the story and the principle of them pushing people is, is that when you are desperate, desperate people will do anything to get to the feet of Jesus. Desperate people, they will do anything to change their lives, changing the outcome of their lives. So Jairus gets to Jesus first, important to notice. And he is desperate because his baby girl is sick. She's not just sick, it says she is dying. Jairus is the equivalent of a 911 caller. It's not... 
It's not a, a call where you're going, um, hi, 911, yes, um, um, how can I help you? Well, um, there's a burglar in my house. Uh, he's got a knife and a gun. Is it possible that you could swing by in about an hour and a half's time and see if you can help me out? Jairus is a 911 caller. Jesus, this is, this is serious stuff. My daughter is so sick. You have to come right now. Jairus is desperate. Jesus, you need to hurry up. This woman is also desperate, but her situation um, has been going on for 12 years. Now, watch how Mark wants us to know that these two situations are connected. Because it just so happens that Jairus' little girl who is dying is 12 years old, and the woman with the issue of blood has been suffering for 12 years. If we had to put this into a timeline, and we had to, had to get the, the, maybe let's say the director of uh, Grey's Anatomy to put this into a movie, or Pure Flix, this would make an amazing movie. 12 years, think about it. There's a woman, she's walking into a hospital, opening scene, one of those rotating doors. She's walking in, her head's down. She's coming to see the doctor for the first time. The next shot, you see there's a donkey pulling a cart, which is the wrong time. So let's, there's a, a car showing up. And there's a guy jumping out of the car and running to get the wheelchair. And my wife's expecting, she's having a baby. My wife's expecting, and he's getting his wife, putting her in the thing. And the, and the, the parents jump out, and they've got the girl. And the, and the guy, I'll get the bag. And then the guy remembers, I forgot the bag. That's one of the first things you learn in having a new baby class. For those of you that haven't had babies yet, men, the only job you have is take the overnight bag. And he forgot the overnight bag. And he's stressing about it because what are they going to do? And then he remembers, oh, my wife's going into labor. So then he runs through the doors. And, and you can see them with excitement going into the, the area where they're supposed to go, where they're going to deliver the baby. And in the next scene, you see the woman sitting at a table in front of the doctor. And the doctor says, we, we got the reports back from your tests. And in the next room, you see the woman, now, she's now in labor, and she's pushing, and she's got the guy's thumb, and she's bending it so far back that it's in pain. She's going to break it. She's literally going to break his hand, and every time she yells, he yells, and she thinks, oh, it's so nice that he's doing this with me, but meanwhile, it's his thumb that's hurting, but he's not telling her that, and in the next room, you see the doctor starts reading the, the news and saying, it's not good news at all. It's, I, I've got really bad news. And in the next room, you're back there again, and, and the doctor says, push, and it's the last push, and you hear a, meh, meh, a little baby crying, right? That little, meh, the, and, and the dad sees the baby for the first time, and he realizes it's ugly. It's because all newborn babies are ugly. Um, it's ugly, and he passes out. And in the room next door, the lady sitting in front of the doctor and he said, we've, we've got no cure for this. There's nothing we can do for you. And the dad wakes up and they say, it's a girl. And in the next scene, what you see is you see these, these two people connecting maybe at the door where she's walking out having no hope. And they walking out of that same door just receiving the greatest gift in their lives, which is a baby girl 12 years ago. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have as a church and as a body is we can be so blind for how good things are going for us that we are blind to what is going on in people's lives that don't have God in their lives. We can be so, so blinded by how it's just my little bless me club is so awesome and we are not called to be blind for what's going on out there. We are called to look and to see, it says in, in Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Let's not miss what God wants us to do, which is to love people. Love people. And as a body, let us not be so selfie focused that we miss what's going on in the world around us.
but we don't influence them. And let us as a body not get involved in, into the soup with nonsense. Let's be relevant for the kingdom purposes. Let's focus on those things and make our voice heard in those areas. Two people were forced to see each other at the feet of Jesus because that's what happened 12 years later. Two twelves touching. Now, the number 12 is very significant in the Bible. It's actually used 187 times, which is a lot. The number 12 is the number of Jacob's sons. The number 12 is very important to God. In most cases, it represents perfection and authority. The 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, representing the power and the authority of God to his nation that's standing under him. The high priests in the Old Testament were wearing a breastplate with 12 precious stones on it, representing the 12 tribes. And the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies wearing the breastplate, saying, God, we are coming under your perfection and your authority. Jesus, the first time he preached was at the tender age of 12 when he walked into the synagogue. Then when Jesus turned 30, he picked 12 disciples. 12 is significant. And he gave the 12 disciples power and authority. He gave them power and authority. Now something he's been telling us since day one is, is the following. We need to understand by the number 12, perfection and authority. There is nothing in this world that is not under his authority. And these two twelves, the woman with the issue of blood and death, the story is there to let us know that no matter what you have, it falls under his authority. It's, if it's a blind eye, a death ear, an issue of blood, a dying girl, whatever it is, nothing is too much for the perfect authority of Jesus Christ. Now, why is this important? Um, New Church, this is important for us because our awareness as a body of His authority and His perfection will determine how you live your life with Him. Your awareness of His authority will determine how we build this church. Our awareness of His authority as a body will determine how we build this church. Once we reduce the text and we look at, at, there's been many areas where people have taken this text and, and they said, you know, they preached on faith and faith and faith. You know, you need to have more faith. And I had, I've heard pastors say, you just need more faith, more faith and more faith. And I really don't think more faith is the problem because it says in the word, we've been given the full measure of faith. I don't think more faith is the issue. Faith is important. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. You need faith. Faith is our anchor. But if you go fishing and you throw the anchor overboard and that anchor is not attached to something, you've just lost a good anchor. Faith needs to be attached. And that attachment of faith is your understanding of God's authority. We need to have a great understanding of God's authority. The anchor has to be connected. My faith is connected to my understanding of His authority, the authority of His Word, the authority and the power that He has. And my faith is connected to relationship with the one that has authority. But our faith has to be connected. If you do not believe that he has the power, your faith will struggle. And some people think that they have a faith problem. I don't think so. I think you have a connection problem. I do not think it's a faith problem. We need to get an awareness of his authority. We do not have a faith problem because we've been dealt the full measure of. We have an awareness of his authority problem. And you say to me, you know, prove it from Scripture. I will prove it from Scripture. That's my annoying person voice. <laughs> Remember, um, I, we, read it, we read it last week. Jesus was on the sea with his disciples and there was a storm. 
Remember, and the, and the, the disciples were worried and they were struggling and because they're going to die, it's a big storm. And Jesus is what? Sleeping. When they wake him up and he says, peace, be still, and it dies down. What is his response to them? O ye of little faith. If you knew who it was with you, you would not have doubted or been been scared. If you are aware of God's authority, instead of being worried, you will look at what God is doing in the situation. He is sleeping. I'm going to go snuggle with Jesus. Because he's sleeping, that is what I will do also. Being aware of his authority will make us change our actions and our decisions. Jairus, Jairus, his awareness of God's authority was the following. Jesus, I need you to come to my house. It's an emergency. I need you to lay hands on my daughter to heal her because she is dying. His awareness was, Jesus, I need you in my house We've set the move. He's a good, good father. He's playing in the background when you get there. Everything's ready. We've got oil. Everything is ready. The atmosphere is set. Jesus, when you're going to go in there, just lay your hands on her, pray for her, and she will be healed. That was his awareness of Jesus' authority. This woman with the issue of blood, she had a different awareness of Jesus' authority. Her awareness that for his authority was, all I need to do is touch his coat. Then Jesus speaks later about a man who's a centurion. And he said, never have I seen such great faith. Why? Because this man said, I am one who is under authority. And I know how it works. All you need to do is speak a word. His awareness of God's authority caused his faith to be great. You want to increase the effectiveness of the full measure of faith that you have? Get a greater understanding of our God's authority and what he wants to do. I'm almost done. The woman goes 12 years approaching people who have no authority. It says she goes from doctor to doctor. She spends all her money. And then finally she reaches Jesus. And her healing was awesome. Amen. That was an amazing healing. That was awesome. But as awesome as it was, it was also an interruption to Jesus' journey on his way to Jairus' home. It actually stopped Jesus in his tracks. Because if you think about it, um, it says that there was a crowd of people around him. Jairus was desperate. He got to Jesus. Jesus, will you come to my house? Yes, I will go to your house, Jairus. Okay, okay, I'm going to lead you there. Okay, out of the way. Sorry, out of the way. It's desperate. Jesus has to get to my daughter. Out of the way. Out of the way. We have to get there. Move, move. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, you're still there. Out of the way. Out of the way. Out of the way. Good. We move. We're making ground. We're making ground. Jesus, you're still. Where'd Jesus go? He was just behind me. Where did he go? Because it actually, if, if you look at the text, it looks like Jairus lost him. Then he goes and he finds Jesus standing, saying the following words in a crowd of people. Who touched me? And Jairus in his mind must have almost lost it. What do you mean who touched you? Peter, ask him, what do you mean who touched you? Because what you're saying is crazy. Everybody touched you. I'll wait. Because that's what Jesus says. Who touched me? I'll wait. And Jairus is like, my daughter is dying and you waiting for somebody to own up. And finally, this lady owns up. And this part is actually very funny. Because the Bible says, um, Jesus said, who touched me? And she says, oh, Jesus was me. I touched you. And then the Bible says, she told him the whole truth. Okay. Another translation says, she told him her whole story. She She, she told him her whole story. While Jairus is waiting, if it was he, it would be like, Jesus, 12 years ago, blood, no more blood, I'm good. Like, thank you, God, gone. If it's a guy, if it's a lady, while it all started, I remember the day I was wearing this 
robe that my mom just made for me, and it was a beautiful robe. Jesus, I remember I was walking down the street, and there were like a few guys whistling at me, and it was awesome. One of the best days. My hair was still way shorter then, and it, it told him the whole truth, right? And Jairus is like, come on, lady. I need him to get to my house. Now, he had to watch her get her miracle. It's hard to wait on a miracle, but now you have to watch her get hers. And that's hard. It's almost like, oh, you finally found a husband. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Hallelujah. I've been praying long also. <laughs> well, you're pregnant. Oh, that's so amazing. Me and my husband have been trying also. We can just keep believing. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's so good. But you, you are excited for them, but you're waiting on yours. It's hard to do that, but I believe God wants to motivate us and he wants to encourage us. That if he can do it for them, he can do it for us also. But this is the thing, and this is really for me one of the main messages for us as a church as we move forward. And I really want us to understand what I believe God is saying to us as leaders um, in this church. Yes, if he did it for me, he can do it for you also. But it does not mean he's going to do it in the same way. Simply because it was done for you, yes, he can do it for you also. But it doesn't mean he's going to do it in the same way. And I really believe, Numa, that we've been called to not look at how churches have done church in the past and think this is how we're going to do it for the future. We are reaching out generations of people that are not being reached in the same way as they used to be reached in the past. And because God has reached people through the church, the church is valuable. The church is important. The church is supposed to function. It does not mean that, that we, we're going to stick to the old ways. We're going to stick to the truths of the word. We will stick to the principles of the Bible. But I really believe God is calling us to, to understand. He's not necessarily t he's calling us to do it the same way as they have done it in the past. And I want to call out out of the young people and the older people in here. I want to call out vision and ideas and thoughts and dreams about how God can use the skills and the abilities and the things that you have in your hand so that we can make a difference in people's lives more and greater than what we are making right now. Because there's a new calling on us. There really is. And it's, 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 there is new ground that has to be walked on. The gospel is the same, but we have to reach new territories. And, and we need you. We need your minds and your, your brilliant thoughts that comes from God to inspire us. Because I want to let you know, as a leadership team in this church, we are open. We open. If there's God ideas and God suggestions and God ways of, of reaching people, we are open to reach people. But we, as a body, we are connected. Your ideas and your thoughts need to connect with ours by just saying, you do you, I do me. That's not going to help us to reach a generation that is currently in a very difficult situation. Where black is no longer black and white is no longer white. And gray is not even gray anymore. These two people connected, both wanting healing. Jairus didn't get a healing. He got a resurrection. Right? Amen. Before we say amen too hard, what comes before a resurrection? A death. Numa, we have to watch out for people. And we have to make sure that, that sometimes be okay with allowing religious things to die off. That's not going to lead us into life. Be okay with it. Because if it's going to lead people into God's kingdom, that's what we've got to do. We need a resurrection for the church. Jesus speaks to Jairus. Because what happens is while Jairus is standing there, he speaks to Jairus. People come to Jairus and say, Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your little daughter is dead. And Jesus speaks to him and he says, Jairus. 
don't be afraid. Just believe. Numa, don't be scared about what's going on out there. Just believe God wants to use us. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And I think this is when the journey really switched. I think that's when Jesus started leading Jairus and saying, I know you think it's over, but it is not. Come on, Jairus. We need to walk to your house. Come on, Jairus. Lift up your head. Follow me. Let's go, Jairus. Let's go. It's time to get there. Come on, Jairus. Something's going to happen. And this is how it's supposed to be because now instead of Jairus leading Jesus, Jesus leads Jairus. And as a church, if we want to see the resurrection of, of the life in church and people coming back into the church, Jesus has to lead us, not tradition, not religion, not this is how my dad's dad did it, but it's not having fruit anymore. We need to be open because our God is creative. He's not behind with technology. He is not slowed down. He's not, um, he doesn't need Mac, Apple to update his computers. He knows all things now and in the future. If he leads us in those things as a church, we will be church leaders. We will not just be a church. It says that he came there and the enemy was laughing at him. And, 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 and I think some of you might be thinking or you might have friends that laugh at you for going to church. And it's time to say to some things, get out. It's time to say get out to certain things in our lives. It's time to say get out to fear. It's time to say get out to anxiety. It's time to say get out to depression. It's time to say get out to self-hatred. It's time to say get out to addictions. And it's time to say get up. Get up, Numa. Get up, church. God wants to do something amazing through this body. We have the privilege to lead this. It is a privilege and an honor. And it's not something that we take lightly. But I also know that this is a weighty um, obligation and call for us as a body. Because we can also just get stuck in a track. Or we can say, God, there's new things that you want us to do. There's new ways you want us to reach. We could lead you or you can lead us. I want God to lead us. We are all connected. You are connected with people that need to hear God's goodness. Amen. Amen. So I believe that God's word for us for um, going into 2020 is get connected. Get connected. I'm not talking about get into a home group, a little home group. or it. Yes, get connected with church. Yes. But the call is greater. Get connected outside the church because you've got something inside of you that they need to see and that they need to hear. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for your goodness. A worship team can come up, please. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. God, I was in that song, Goodness of God. It just spoke to my heart again how, how your goodness is running after us, Lord. And Father, I pray that for the next years, 10, 20, 30 years to come, that our awareness of who you are will just increase. That our relationship with you will just grow more. That we'll get closer and closer to you because there's no better place to be. Because, Father, we don't just want to play church and just be a happy little family inside. Yes, we want to be a happy family inside also. But we want to change and impact the lives that you've called us to impact and change. Father God, I pray that you will set up connections, divine connections that would lead people to places in their lives that they never could have imagined. Where like I can say now, Lord, 
30 years ago, you connected me with Neville to be here today. That was your divine connection, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we will have that desire and that passion in us to make that impact in other people's lives also. We love you, God. You are good. And we're thankful for everything that you do. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.